Welcome everyone, my name is Samantha Oakley from ALA's Public Programs Office. I'm pleased to introduce today's webinar, Taking Care of Us, Ergonomic Advice for Library Staff. Periodically, we invite library professionals to spend an hour with us to share their experiences and insights from their work. Today, we're excited to host certified yoga teacher and library director, Jen Carson. We'll be switching over to the live stream video of Jen in a couple of minutes, but before we do, I'd like to take a few quick um, announcements. Today's webinar is presented by ALA's Public Programs Office with support from ALA's Cultural Communities Fund. To learn more about the Cultural Communities Fund or make a contribution, visit ala.org ccf. Hopefully many of you are familiar with Programming Librarian, a website of ALA's Public Programs Office. We have a lot of program ideas and an online learning library full of free webinars like this one. Finally, a couple of notes about our virtual classroom. Only our presenter has microphone access, but you are welcome to type your questions or comments into the chat box. We will have time for Q&A at the end. Also, if you have any technical issues, please send a private message to Brian Russell. To do so, hover over Brian's name in the upper right-hand corner of your screen and click pr Start Private Chat. Now, I'd like to introduce our presenter, Jen Carson. Jen is the director of the L.P. Fisher Public Library in Woodstock, New Brunswick, and creator of yogainthelibrary.com. If you're a frequent visitor or programming librarian, you may recognize her for the movement-based blog she writes for the site. She also regularly presents at conferences and webinars on the subject, and currently she's writing a book on physical literacy programming in libraries for ALA editions. Today, Jen will be sharing an easy self-care routine that you can do while manning the circulation desk, on a conference call, or sitting at your desk. Throughout this ses session, she'll demonstrate seven simple things you can start doing to feel better while working, including breathing exercises, easy, easy meditation tricks, how to maintain proper posture at your desk, and small movements you can do start, start doing with your hands, eyes, and spine to help relieve tension. With that, I will turn things over to Jen. Or afternoon, wherever you are. Um, thanks so much for joining me today. I'm really glad that you could take the time to learn how to take care of yourself. Um, in libraries and schools where most of us work, oh, we get tired. We take care of people all the time and we're always giving of ourselves to everyone. And sometimes we really need to just take just five minutes and learn to take care of yourself. And so that's why I created this infographic, which you can download on the bottom of your screen there, um, to put up in your office or in your staff room as a little reminder of things that you can do to take care of yourself during the day. Um, at the bottom of the screen, you'll also find a download for this infographic as well, which is a little stretch routine that we're gonna go over some of today um, that you can do in your office or workstation. Um, so we're going to start going over the seven things, just little tips and tricks that you can do to take care of your body. And hopefully you'll go back and share this with your staff and your colleagues as well. Um, so let's start first um, by talking about uh, why I developed this program. So we're going to go back to the slide stat, and I'm just going to go over um, a little bit why I discovered this was so important. So you guys bring that up for me? Thanks. So when I was working at the York Regional Offices of the New Brunswick Public Library Service, um, I noticed I was doing a lot of yoga with patrons, but I noticed that the staff really needed some help as well. Um, we all have you know, issues with our own bodies and our own attention spans. And so I created a 15 minute yoga break program. So every week we would meet just for 15 minutes on our coffee break and do yoga instead of sitting in the lunchroom, which is what we normally did. And at the end of this session, um, you know, I was I did it for about six months, eight months, and um, I gave a little just anonymous survey monkey to everybody um, to fill out. And this is what it came back with the results is 100% of the people that participated in my program felt more focused at work. And I was like, whoa, 100%. That's good odds. Um, you know, that's a really good result. And then they also, as you can see, they felt more connected, not just to their work, but they felt connected to each other. So taking a few moments each day to engage in physical activity and, you know, be a little silly, because let's face it, you're in your dress clothes and you're, you know, putting your arms behind your head and, and you know, getting down on the floor. They, we got to laugh together at, at you know, human bodies. They're, they're not perfect. Um, they also felt more grounded. They felt like they weren't as easily distracted. They felt like they could focus more. Um, they felt like they had more energy. So as opposed to using, I know one of my one staff said to me, 
you know, I always thought of a break as being a rest. I thought like, oh, I'm going to get up from my workstation and go into the staff room and have a rest. But now I think of a break as a, not just a physical body break, but a mental break. And what can I do to break out of what I was doing, whether it's, you know, entering data on a on a screen or answering the phone or helping a patron, what can I do to break away from what I was just doing? And so they felt that that was really helpful as well, including um, about 45% of people felt more mindful as well. So they felt that they were paying more attention during the day to what they were doing. So that's just a little bit of, um, you know, just a small, small group survey of how the staff that I was working with at the York regional offices felt after they did um, just a little bit of yoga with me once a week, 15 minutes. So imagine if you did it every day, how it could make a difference in your work day and also your home life. So anyway, just wanted to share that with you and, and why, how this whole, whole thing got started about not just teaching yoga to patrons, which I've been doing for about eight years, but also teaching it to staff as well. So let's get started on our breathing. So the most important thing um, before we do anything else is that I want you guys breathing properly. So you have five lobes in your lungs. Um, you've got two on the left hand side, which is your smaller lung because of your heart. And then you've got three lobes on your right hand side. And so you, you really want to be using all of your lung capacity when you breathe. We don't, but we usually just breathe up here. And so you'll notice during the day your shoulders going up and down as you breathe. That's not good. So what you want to do is you want to take your breath and you want to drop it way down in your belly. So everybody put your hand on your belly. So right here, right around your belly button, your solar plexus, I want you to hold on to that guy. We're so used during the day to sucking our tummies in, especially women. We're taught all the time to keep our stomach, stomach sucked in. I don't want you to do that. I want you to just let your belly round out like it should. So if you watch kids run around or you watch babies sleeping, they have those cute little rounded bellies that go up and down, up and down as they breathe. And they hang out over their pants and they're adorable. That's what your belly's supposed to look like. And so when you breathe, your diaphragm's expanding and your belly's pushing out so you can breathe better. And then it's going to come back in to expel the air. So that's what you want it to do. But we've you know, out of bad habits and, and social conditioning have done the opposite. We suck our tummy in and we breathe up into our chest. So I want you to retrain your brain to breathe properly. That's the most important thing. So what happens when you use all of your lungs is that it lowers your cortisol and your adrenaline and all of those fight or flight hormones. If you keep breathing shallowly, your body being the smart body it is will think that you're being chased by a polar bear. It'll be put into fight or flight. And so it'll be ready to take off which is useful if you're being chased by a polar bear, but if you're just sitting in traffic or answering phones at the CERC desk, not so helpful. And you get into a heightened state of anxiety, and then by the time you get home at the end of the day, you're either so anxious you're up here, or you're so depleted from using all of those hormones all day that you just crash and then you feel depressed. And so we kind of keep that up, down, up, down, up, down going all the time instead of a, a more calm state. So put your hand on your belly, and I want you to just inhale, and as you inhale, your belly's going to go out. And as you exhale, your belly comes in. Inhale, belly goes out. Now, if you look at my shoulders, they're hardly moving. Exhale, belly comes in. You can close your eyes if you want. Inhale. I can't see you anyway. <laughs> inhale, belly goes out. Exhale, belly comes in. Good. Inhale, belly goes out. Exhale, belly comes in. See if you can breathe right into your back. I say puff out your kidneys. So see if you can breathe into your kidneys. Inhale, right into the back part of your lungs. And exhale. So anytime during the day that you feel you notice that anxiety creeping up, come back to your breath and breathe down into your belly. It will significantly reduce, reduce those hormone levels and you'll notice a drop in two or three seconds. Your heart rate will lower, but you have to be mindful and take the time to think about it. So inhale, belly goes out. Exhale, belly comes in. And I know you're thinking, I don't have time during the day to think about breathing. Breathing's an autonomic nervous system process. I should just do it. I don't want to have to think about it. So what I like to do is you can either set a timer on your phone. I have a visual timer here at my desk. These are great, by the way, if you work with uh, kids that have sensory processing issues, they can see the time. So set it for every 30 minutes. Take a little break to stretch and breathe properly. Another thing you can do is have a nice big bottle of water on your desk and have a big drink. Drink that all day. You'll definitely need to get up and pee. And when you get up to pee, say, oh yes, I'm going to breathe properly. 
and do your nice breathing exercises and your stretching exercises when you take your pee break or when your timer tells you it's time to do that. And so that's the, one of the most fundamental things that you can do to lower your stress is you're going to want to learn how to breathe properly. And it takes a while. And doing yoga classes and things like that will also help reinforce it. So if you can get into a local yoga class or a local meditation center, that will help. So moving on to meditation, <clears throat> the next thing I want to talk about was how to meditate, which sounds very daunting if you don't do it, but it's actually not hard at all. And that's why no one does it, because it's the easiest thing in the world. And people don't like doing easy things. <laughs> we want we want a reward with a gold star and a, a tough thing. Okay, so here's what you do to meditate. Nothing. <laughs> you sit and you breathe. And that's it. And so you can meditate anywhere. You can do it sitting in traffic. You can do it sitting in a really boring meeting. You can do it while you're sitting at your desk. You can do it while you're walking. And so meditation is really being mindful of what's happening in your body and in your mind. And so people think that it's clearing the mind of all thought, and it's not. So I want you to come back to kind of putting your hand on your belly and take a nice deep inhale and exhale. And after you do this for a few minutes, your mind is going to wander away from your breathing. You'll start thinking about what you're going to have for lunch or things you need to do or, oh, my to-do list, my, you know, my email, something that's going on at home. And so meditation is just noticing that you're thinking and then coming back to your breath. That's it. So you're like, oh, look at me thinking. Oh, back to the breath back to the breath. Oh, oh yeah, I got to take the chicken out of, oh yeah, blah, 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 your mind goes off, and then, oh, thinking. Back to the breath, and that's it. It's just an exercise in training your mind, because your mind is a tool, and it's an important tool. It's there to scan the horizon, to look for danger, which is why it's usually worried about things. You're always thinking of what's the next thing I need to know of, because let's face it, Humans don't like uncertainty, so we want to be sure of what's happening in our environments. We're trained that way. We're, we're, it's our instinct, right, to keep us safe. That's normal. That There's nothing wrong with that. But you want to have control over it, right? You don't want it to have control over you. So by, by bringing yourself back to your breath, you have control over your mind, which is a tool for you to use instead of the opposite where your mind is controlling everything you're doing and you're just kind of like the puppet going through the motions. And so try and do that during the day. Notice if you're sitting in a meeting and your mind's kind of wandering off to things that you have to do, say, oh, look, thinking, and then come back to doing that breathing that we've been practicing down in your belly. And so imagine it as, you know, the sky and the clouds are your thoughts and they're just passing by. And so sometimes those thoughts can be big and stormy rain clouds or maybe, you know, a tornado starting. And other times they're just those cute little puffy clouds and they're not inconsequential dogs and cats and fluff fluff. Okay. And so you just, you watch them. They're all just clouds and you, you are the sky and you're just watching those clouds. And if you don't like the sky metaphor, you can also think about waves in an ocean. They're just coming in and coming out, but you're the ocean. Okay. Those thoughts are not you. They're just coming in and out of you and you just watch them go by. So that's my very, very, very quick introduction to meditation. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is posture and desk ergonomics. So some of you may um, have already gotten assessed for your workstation. Some of you, this might be your first introduction to ergonomics. So I personally am sitting on a bouncy ball. <laughs> so I have this really cool bouncy ball here. I, this was not provided by work, I paid for it. Um, it's a bouncy ball chair. So it is a nice big chair that's got a big bouncy ball to it. And I sit on this pretty much all day, for those of you that missed that, there you go. And what you want to do is sit on it right on the edge and sit up nice and tall, and that engages your core muscles. So if you can get one of those, I think I got that for about $100 online. I ordered it from Costco, I think. And it forces you to sit up nice and straight and have good posture. It's also fun if you get easily bored or distracted like I do, because if you are a kinesthetic learner and you need to move all the time while you're working because you fidget, this is perfect. So those bouncy ball chairs are great. If you do not happen to have one, I'm going to show you a proper posture on a regular old office chair, which I also use sometimes as a break when my bum gets tired sitting on the ball. So 
first things first with your office chair, if you see the little picture up in the corner of the screen here, you can see all the nice right angles. That's what we want, right angles. So you're going to sit up nice and tall, take your back and put it right against the lumbar support on your chair. That's what it's there for. Use it. So squeeze your bum back until you're right at the back of your chair. Then you're going to have your handles, if you have handles on your chair, armrests I should say, that you're going to rest your arms on and those should be at a 90 degree angle to your body. I know you guys can't see me because I have good posture so it's below the level of the camera. But if you look, nope, this way, ah, this way, this way, <laughs> over here, you'll see what, what I'm doing. So my feet are flat on the floor, my arms are at a 90 degree angle to my body, and my mouse is just at my fingertips. And so I can, right now I'm moving my mouse and you can't tell, right? So there shouldn't be any of this motion because that's going to cause a lot of problems in your shoulder during the day. You want your mouse right next to your body. And so can you see me moving my mouse? No, you can't. Same thing with the phone. You don't want to be doing this all day with your phone. If you can use a headset, perfect. If not, you want to hold the phone up to your ear. You don't want to bring yourself to the phone. You want to bring the phone to you. Your keyboard should be at 90 degrees to your body as well as your mouse. And the, oh, your computer screen should be right in line with your eyes. So for me, my computer screen when I, when I moved into this office was way too low. So I actually have two discarded books underneath my computer monitor and I have it propped up about four inches. So it's directly in line with the middle of my site. So if you look at this, the, the, that guy over there, you can see that he's all lined up. So his, actually his is a little bit low. His should be a little bit higher because it should be right in the middle of your screen. Okay, so that's good posture and good desk ergonomics. You wanna make sure that you get up and move around. So once again, have a timer, set a timer on your phone. Every 15 or 20 minutes, half an hour at the most, you should get up and just do a little walk around the office just to get the blood flow. And if your feet aren't flat on the floor, adjust your chair um, or put some books underneath your feet and prop yourself up if you're short. If you're working at a circ desk where you have a lot of different people using the same chairs, Take the two seconds and adjust the chair. Don't sit there all day using the chair that's not proper for you. Take the time and adjust the workstation. It's better to take two minutes today to adjust your workstation than to be off sick for a week because you've thrown your shoulder out because you were mousing like this all day. So that's just my quick advice for some desk ergonomics. There's all kinds of really good books and tips and things you can find um, on ergonomics. If you have specific questions about it, please send me an email. They'll put my contact information up. And you can even send me a picture of your workstation and I can give you some examples of things that you can do to make yourself more comfortable. So the next thing we're going to talk about um, is eyes. So most of us have two of them. Um, so you want to take good care of them because we spend a lot of time looking at a screen all day. And what happens when we do that is it really narrows um, your focused vision. I see someone's asking um, if you're sitting on a ball. I will talk about ball posture at the end in the Q&A. Um, okay, so we want to get to eyes, narrowed focused vision, looking at a computer screen all day. So you want to take a break from that. Our eyes were not designed for up close reading all the time. Um, if you start studying the rise and the history of myopia, myopia being um, nearsightedness when you can see close up but not far away, there's been a huge increase in myopia in the last hundred years. I don't think that's a coincidence. We're spending less and less time outdoors, less and less time looking at far, far distances on the horizon. Um, so our eyes, understandably, get lazy and weak, and we only look at things that are very, very close up all the time. And so we have this kind of customized vision that's great at looking at little details, terrible at looking at things far away. And so what you want to do is take time during the day to look off into the distance and then bring your vision back. So I'm really lucky you can't see, but my office has glass windows all at the front of it. So I can actually look out right onto the horizon, right onto the streetscape through the windows of the library and then come back to my desk. So same thing, when you have your timer set, do your breathing break, do your stretch break, give yourself a little eye break, take a rest from your screen and look out. Do it as many times as you can. So we're going to do a little exercise. You have nine um, muscles around your eye, including the ones that work on your eyelid. So you want to give those a break. So if you have glasses on, take your specs off. Us librarians and our specs. So you're going to take your glasses off, and I want you to take your hands, and I want you to get them ready because you're going to rub them together and get them nice and warm. But for now, I don't want you to use them at all. So get them nice and warm. 
put them between your legs or something because you want them all warmed up. We're just going to work out our ocular nerve and those muscles I was talking about. So I don't want you to move your head. I just want you to move your eyes. You're going to look funny. You're going to look like you joined a cult. So if you're like me and you have glass windows, people are looking in at me right now. I'll look silly, but I don't care. So you're going to look up towards the ceiling and then down towards the ground and then up towards the ceiling and then down towards the ground and then up towards the ceiling and down towards the ground. And then I want you to look all the way to the right and all the way to the left, all the way to the right and all the way to the left. One more, all the way to the right and all the way to the left. Now we're going to do some figure eights. Top right hand corner, bottom left hand corner, top left hand corner, bottom right hand corner, top right hand corner, bottom left hand corner, top left hand corner, bottom right hand corner. One more time. Top right hand corner, bottom left hand corner, top left hand corner, bottom right hand corner. Good. Take your hands in front of you. Get them nice and warm. Rub them together. Put them in your armpits. Do whatever you have to, have to do. Rub, 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 rub. Get them warm. Ah, and then place them over your eyes and just give yourself a nice little sensory break. Ah, take a deep inhale and exhale in your belly. Good. And give yourself a nice gentle rub on the face. I can't do it because of my microphone, but a little nice rub. <sighs> and then slowly open your eyes. Good. Feel better? Right. So you could probably feel your, your muscles working in your eyes. They're not used to that much work, so they might even feel a little sore when you're doing that. But it's really good for you. So see if you could do that even just once a day. You'll find it will actually improve your vision and your, your eyesight will be a little sharp, sharper and you'll feel better for it. Um, so that's some eye movements. Um, let's work out the hands because hands are something that we use all the time, all day with our mousing and our keyboarding and our texting and all the things that we're doing and our hands get really, really tight and crampy. Um, we're going to do some exercises that involve moving the shoulders. If you have a rotator cuff issue, we're going to be internally and externally rotating our shoulder cuff uh, here, our shoulder girdle. So just be careful if you feel any twinges. Sharp shooting pain is bad. Achy muscle pain is fine. But you know your own bodies. I can't see you. You're all over the place. Trust yourself. If it doesn't feel good, don't do it. So I want you to take your hands up in the air. I want you to bring your fingertips towards you. And then you're going to send them away. Bring them up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down and up. And then we're going to go out, out. This is the rotator cuff part I was talking about. Careful. And in, only go as far as your body wants you to. 80% of 100 is good. And out, and in, good. And out, and in, and out, and in, and out, and in. Okay, bring your fingers in. And out, and out. Keep going. Keep going. Go a little bit faster. Go a little bit faster. I know this kills the tendons <laughs> and the muscles in your forearms. Keep going. Go as fast as you can, like you're flicking water at somebody you don't like. Flick, flick, flick. Maybe it's me right now. Flick, flick, flick. Keep going. Ah, that's nice. Another thing you can do for your wrist is take your thumb and your ring finger together and then just do some little circles. And go the other way. You might hear some snap, crackle, pops. My, my wrist is cracking right now. That's normal. That's just the synovial fluid in your joints expanding. It's actually like a gas bubble. So if you're, uh, if you're cracky, you just have gassy joints. You can just tell people that. Sorry, it's just my gassy joints. But uh, it's not, it's not going to hurt you to crack your knuckles there. Mine just cracked. It won't hurt you. It's just the gas popping apart. Just like when you wash dishes and sometimes they stick together and then they pop apart. That's all it is. It's just air in your joints. So that's a good way to work out your hands. Try and do that when you set your timer to have your little break at your workstation. Okay, next thing we're going to talk about is alternate nostril breathing. Whoa, what's that? <laughs> so <laughs> we have two nostrils, most of us, um, and primarily you should be breathing out of one nostril predominantly at a time and not breathing out of both of them evenly at the same time. 
What? Mind blown. I know, it's true. Every two and a half hours, your body goes through a cycle called the nasal cycle. And so your body will switch breathing predominantly on one side or the other, normally, every two, two to two and a half hours. I know that sounds crazy, but it's true. So what happens is as we get stressed out during the day and we develop bad habits over and over and over again, we usually breathe on our dominant side more than the other side. So if you are a right hander like me, I know I'm backwards because of the camera, but if you go mostly on the right hand, you breathe predominantly on the right hand side. And so the left hand side of your body is what's kind of in control. And if you breathe mostly on the left hand side, the right side of your body is in control. So if you're, if you're a right nostril breather like me, um, that's good. That means you're up all the time. You've got lots of endorphins. You're super energized. <sighs> but man, that's hard on the body. Lots of cortisol, lots of testosterone, lots of endorphins. Up, 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 up. If you're the kind of person who breathes mostly on your left side, low cortisol, low testosterone, but also low blood pressure, less heart attacks. So that's good. But everything is kind of in a resting state. And so your body will cycle back and forth between the two, but stress kind of tends to make us breathe on one side over the other. There's a cool link that I've put in the bottom that you can read a whole bunch more about this science because I don't have time to get into it today, but it's amazing. So what you do for alternate nostril breathing is to force your body back into its nasal cycle of breathing on each side evenly. So you're not just getting oxygen mostly on one side of the body and the other. Okay, the other thing is that anytime we do a cross lateral movement, so do this with me right now. <sighs> this is a cross lateral movement, or this, anything, whatever. You know when you're anxious or you're like, people, go away people, and you automatically kind of cross your arms like, Bleh, get away. That's instinctive, that's your body's defense mechanism because when you cross one arm over the other or you cross your legs one over the other, it's a protective mechanism, it lowers your blood pressure. And so anytime you do anything that is a cross lateral movement, I teach kids that are on the autism spectrum to do that when they're having a meltdown across their bodies um, because it lowers all of those stress hormones. So this, this is resetting that as well because we're doing some cross lateral movement. So you're going to take two fingers, put it in the middle of your forehead. I know you look crazy. Join the club. So you're going to take your thumb and your ring finger and you're going to put one on each nostril. So now you sound like this. <laughs> Don't plug it for too long. Also, if you're pregnant, Please don't do this because you're going to restrict your airflow and I don't want to hurt the baby just in case. Just just watch us look silly. Watch me look silly. Um, if you have a stuffy nose too, you can try but you might not get a lot of airflow. So just a precaution. So fingers in the middle of the forehead. Get your thumb ready. Get your ring finger ready. So you're going to plug up the left nostril with your ring finger and breathe in on the right side. Now you're going to plug both nostrils. One, two, three, four. Hold it, and now breathe out on the ring finger side. Good, inhale. One, two, three, four. Breathe out on the nostril, this one. Thumb side, inhale, plug. Exhale, inhale, plug. Exhale. Right side, let's go. Let go of the ring side. Inhale. Plug. Exhale. Inhale. Plug. Exhale, ring. Inhale, ring. Hold. Exhale, thumb, last one. Good. How are you breathing? Good? So, you'll notice, if you're not stuffy, that that really clears things up there. <sighs> Feels good. So, if you could just do that even like five times a day, it will reset your brain and tell you to reset that nasal cycle. So, you'll start doing your two and a half hour nasal flip and you'll breathe properly during the day. Even if you do that in bed at nighttime or first thing in the morning before you wake up, it's, it, it really makes a difference. I know it seems weird, but meh, if it works, who cares? 
Um, so that's alternate nostril breathing. Okay, I got one more cool thing to show you, and then we're like running out of time. I wish I have like 10 years of fun information in my brain. I could just bleh all over you, but I can't. Okay, so six essential movements of the spine. So your spine needs to move in six ways every day in order to stay healthy. So you've got your spinal column, You've got your spinal dura, which is like a tube running down your spinal column, and then you've got this fluid that runs inside that tube. So you want to keep all of that stuff moving around, all the blood and the lymph moving, so you're getting all the energy going up and down your body, and it doesn't get contracted and compacted sitting all day. Okay, so you can do this standing, but for now we're going to do it sitting since this is kind of a sitting, sitting workshop. So you're going to sit up nice and tall with your good posture, and then I want you to take your hands up in the air, and you're going to do like a Charlie's Angels gun. Up like this. So you're going to inhale and then exhale, turn towards the right. Inhale back to center. Exhale, turn towards the left. Inhale back to center. Exhale, lean towards the right. Inhale back up. Exhale, lean towards the left. Inhale back up. Okay, be careful. We're going to lean back just a wee bit. Don't hurt yourself. Let go. Ah, feels good. Inhale up. And then don't hit your head on your desk, okay? Space, and then you're gonna lean forward and then just let everything hang loosey-goosey like a rag doll. Oh, this feels good. Just lean over your belly, look at your shoes, and then slowly inhale, roll back up. Take your shoulders, scrunch them up and drop. Scrunch them up and drop. Scrunch them up and drop. Oh, have a little nap. You're good. So those are your six essential movements of the spine. They're on this, so you can download that so you remember how to do it. Um, there's a really good way of doing it like totally stealth in a meeting. Nobody will know you're doing it, so I do this all the time. I'll just be sitting in my meeting, you know, completely paying attention, of course, um, and then I just reach behind me, one, reach behind me, oh, look, oh, look over there, and then, oh gosh, I'm just going to lean that way. Oh, 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 look at that interesting chair. And then, oh, the ceiling tiles. Look at all the dots. And then, oh, I dropped my pencil. And then come back up. Ta-da! You've done your six essential movements, and you didn't even need your Charlie's Angels guns. Um, but, I mean, that helps because it stretches out all your intercostal muscles along your ribs. So if you can get away with doing this, awesome. If you can even say to everybody in the meeting room, hey, let's take a two-second break to do our six essential movements of the spine. Jen said we could. It's good for us. Go for it, do it. But if you have to be stealth about it, you can find ways to move that spine around. So um, that's as much time as I have to, to give you as much information as I can in 30 minutes. I'll open the floor up to some questions. I probably won't have time to answer all of them. I'm sure you guys all have amazing questions. If you don't get your question answered today, please send me an email. Go to www.yogainthelibrary.com or they'll have my email up here. You can ask me lots of questions. I love helping people. It's what I do. So please send them away. Okay, let's put things out here, see what I get. Thanks, guys. Great, thanks, Jen. Thanks, Jen. Um, we'll leave the room open for about five more minutes to answer questions. I know that um, we ran a little bit over, but that's okay. If you have time to stick around, um, I hope you do so that you can hear some great answers. Um, so one of the questions that we have is if you ever use a standing desk. Uh, oh, actually, good question. I personally don't have a standing desk here in my office, but our CERC desk has an option for we have a standing desk as well as we have a sitting desk. And so I will almost always use the standing computer instead of the sitting computer. And so if you're standing at your workstation, same thing. So you want to have your feet hip width apart. Most people think hip width is like this. Your hips are not that wide. So you want to have hip width apart and you want your arms at 90 degrees, and you want your mouse arm moving hardly at all. Just a little bit like this, back and forth, and you want your keyboard right here. So you should still look like that little guy that we had up, and your vision should still be even with the screen. You shouldn't be looking down like this all the time, or you're going to get the librarian hump from leaning over. So there's a really great book. Um, I can send the link to AL, the, these guys at ALA, and they can, they can add it to the presentation. Um, what is it called? I have it at home. Um, something about standing, standing desks. I'll find it for you. And so if you're interested in a standing workstation, I, ha I do have a standing workstation at home that's adjustable for when I write at home. The, so I do recommend 
alternating between standing and sitting during the day if you can. Hopefully that answers your question. Oh, yes, uh, sitting on a ball. So, you guys that might want to buy a ball, if, or if you already have one, so you can, get, my ball chair is actually on casters. So I've had both. I've had just a really big bouncy ball on the floor that I like sat on and rolled around. That was my first version. Um, I prefer this one because it has more stability. Um, also, you can make it a little higher. So same thing. You want to inflate your ball so it's firm, but not so firm you're going to roll off. You want it to have a good amount of bounce. And once again, you can't see my knees, but they're at the like perfect 90 degree angle like the guy was in the picture. So same thing. You need to make your ball big enough that you can have a 90 degree angle and your feet are flat on the floor. That's what you want. You don't want to be on your tiptoes and you don't want to be sunk right down. And I recommend like I have a friend that bought this ball chair at the same time as I did. And I like to tease him because he's lazy and he only uses it like once in a while. And um, he's like, but it makes my abs so tired. And I'm like, that's because you're using them. <laughs> so <laughs> you will get like your bum will get a little sore, like your piriformis and your gluteus max muscles um, because they're, they're, they're being worked. And the same thing with your, um, your ab muscles. You, I mean, I don't have a six pack or anything, but you do get nice strong abs from sitting up all day because if you don't, you, you will roll right off. <laughs> so, so yeah, I use this probably at least three or four days a week all day. And then when my bum gets a little tired, I switch over to my regular chair. Hopefully that answers anyone's questions. Any other questions? Um, yeah, we have quite a few. Uh, so Teresa would like to know if you have any resources for computer eye strain information that would help. Yeah, sure. Um, so do you want to know more about what happens to your eye when they are strained or ways to recover from eye strain? I believe she's typing. Okay, perfect. Recover, please. Uh, ah, good. Someone just adjusted their chair. Yay! Yay! Uh, she would like to know both. <laughs> oh, okay, sure. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll absolutely, I'll get you some resources. There's a really great book, actually, once again, whose name I cannot remember because I'm on camera, um, about recovering your eyesight. And so you can actually make myopia better. Um, by there's a whole bunch of exercises you can do to actually improve your myopia. I'm saying this as someone who wears like a minus eight lens. So <laughs> obviously I haven't used it, but there are exercises you can do that will improve your vision. I don't really care too much about the fact I can't see. I don't like my eyes feeling tired. And so there's all kinds of things that you can do to rest your eyes during the day. Um, one thing that I really like is having a little eye pillow. Um, you can fill it with just some rice, you know, sew it yourself, just a little rectangle, fill it with rice, put a little bit of lavender in there if you like the smell of lavender. And then take a little break during the day, lay down and just chuck that over your eyes. It'll just give you a, a, a second to just kind of chill out. But the most important thing is warmth. So rubbing, putting some warmth on your eyes and also taking sensory breaks. So really stop looking at screens and just cover your eyes up. And then also changing your directional focus. So making sure you're looking all the way around using your peripheral vision and also looking into the distance. So that will really make a big difference, but I will definitely, I'm making myself a note right now. Um, links for eye strain. And what was the other one? Oh, standing desks. Got it. Can do. Okay, next. We had some questions about how to posture yourself uh, whenever you're working a circulation desk while on a stool. If you could maybe... Oh. Yeah, um, I don't like stools. <laughs> I would rather stand than use a stool. Um, if it's the right height for you to stand, I would take standing, unless you have mobility issues that don't allow you to stand, um, you know, like fibromyalgia and stuff like that. Even if you had fibromyalgia or other issues that impact your joints, I would get a nice thick standing pad. You can get those at the, um, uh, like, I don't know what you guys have in the States, but um, like those kitchen supply stores, you can get the really nice thick ones. Um, I have a staff member that, that uh, we use one of those. It helps their knees. Um, so I would always stand over sitting on a stool. Um, if you are sitting on the stool, the same, same principles apply. You want to have rungs on the stool that you can put your feet on so your knees are at a 90 degree angle. 
you won't have any lumbar support with a stool unless it has a back to it. If it has a back, like it's a bar stool, scoot your bum right back there and use the support. That's what it's there for. If it doesn't, um, sit, sit in the middle of the stool and keep a nice firm back support. Um, you guys are going to think I'm crazy, but one way to improve your back posture is to wear a corset. <laughs> I know I like I just took myself back to the Victorian period, but it's actually true. Um, if you you can get a back brace or a back support, which will teach you to sit up properly. I don't recommend it. I would rather you use your muscles, but for some people whose muscles are atrophied or have a really hard time isolating those muscles, um, actually wearing a corset. Don't don't do it tight. This is not for like show. You it's like stealth. You put it under your clothes. Um, will actually help you to have proper posture and sit up. Just don't cinch it really tight because you're going to mess up your, your ribs and your internal organs. But I will use a, sometimes if my belly muscles are really lax, if I've had a couple, I've had a couple kids, so sometimes um, if my belly isn't in good shape, I will wear a corset for a few days to get my posture back into shape, and then I'll, I'll be fine. I'll go back to my regular sitting posture. But if I've been lazing around a bit or I notice I'm really schlumpy, corsets will help. I know that sounds crazy and medieval of me, but it works. Oh, Ainsley, right. yes, you can share the recorded session. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, a link will be sent out to the recording very shortly after the end of this webinar. Um, we'll take one or two more questions. Um, I know that some of you are asking very specific things. Um, Jen's contact is up in the upper right-hand corner of the screen if you would like to send her any um, questions that don't get answered. Yes, so, for sure. and reach out to your local occupational therapist or your doctor or other yoga teachers because they're they're great. I'm you know I don't have all the answers. I just can tell you what I've learned. But there's all kinds of people in your area that have the same kind of skills that I have. I'm not an anomaly. I'm just me doing this as a librarian. But there's all kinds of people that can help you. So if you're hurting, ask for help. Number one rule: if you don't feel good at work, don't keep feeling bad at work. Get do something about it because you got to be here every day. So you want to be happy about it. Great. Um, so let's do, I think, two more questions. Um, Bree would like to know any posture suggestions for dual screen use? Sure, yeah. Um, so same, same idea. You're going to sit up nice and tall. Um, ideally, you want to have uh, your screen right in front of you, and then you want to be able to move your body. So you're not cranking your neck all the time, but your whole body posture is shifting. This is when a ball on casters is really helpful or a chair on casters is really helpful. So you're not cranking your neck to the side back and forth to look at your screens. You're moving your whole body. I know that that's a lot more work, but do a little bit more effort now to not have the, the bad effects later. Oh, instant gratification. It gets all of us. So um, options. You can have your screens kitty corner like this, and you can always be rotating back or forth between the two. I don't like that. I would have a, rather have one dominant screen and then one kitty cornered a little bit off to the side. Um, and then use your dominant screen the most, and then when you have to look at the one that's, that's at an angle, you know, slight body rotation, but not cranking your neck back and forth. Um, I'll send some links. So I'll just want to write down links for dual screens. Great question. Yeah, some people even have three screens. Same thing, you want to have your dominant one in the middle, the right eye height, and then you're going to just rotate like this. Mousing is still the same, keyboard is still the same. Great. Um, so I think the other question we had was um, rather specific. It's, sorry, where to go? Um, how often do you do these uh, talks, Jen? Oh, uh, you... <laughs> uh, well, in my region, I do them all the time. The poor people that work with me are so sick of me, I'm sure, because every meeting I get up and like stretch break, and then and then they're they're stuck with me. Um, but yeah, I travel around to conferences two or three times a year and and do this. Um, you know, mostly locally, but I I try and come out as much as I can and afford to. Um, and then I, I do webinars for um, the Ontario Library Association as well as um, as for you guys. So I'd be more than happy to do more. Or if you want me to come to you wherever your conference is, I'd be happy to travel. I love sharing this information. Um, one other thing I noticed somebody had said about 
low back pain and the ball. So if you have low back pain, you have weak belly muscles. I know, I'm sorry. It's, I hate to tell people that, but it's true. So usually, I'm just gonna show you guys those that are still here. So if you've got a bum that's doing this or doing this, that's really exaggerated to show you. So you either have lordosis or kyphosis in your spine. Okay, you might also have scoliosis, which is when your spine has an S shape to it sideways. Okay, okay, so those are all real, those are conditions that are all really hard on the low back. You'll notice my belly's pooping, at, pooping out here a little bit. I just said pooping, that's hilarious. Poofing out a little bit. Okay, that's good because I'm breathing with my belly. I don't care about sucking it in. So, same with the low back. You don't want to have the J. Lopez bum as cool as it looks. You want to try and tuck that guy under so you have a nice neutral pelvis. Same thing when you're sitting. Try not to do this or this. Try and keep your pelvis neutral. So a ball will help with that because you've got to sit up nice and straight so you don't roll off it, but it's going to be a killer on your belly muscles because low back, usually, unless you have an injury like a slip disc or something, just regular low back pain is usually caused from having a weak core. So the stronger your core gets, the less your low back hurts. Like I have a super strong core. Like I said, I don't have a six pack or anything. It's just a regular mom belly, but I have a really strong core and I never have low back pain. Like I can't remember the last time I had low back pain. And it's because I sit on a ball all day and my belly's nice and strong. So work on the belly and you'll really fix the low back. Unless you have an injury, in which case go see a doctor. Great. Thanks, Jen. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, the link to the live recording will be emailed to everyone very shortly. Thanks again.